Master of Engineering in Surgery and Intervention, Intervention Program here at Vanderbilt. For those that may not might, uh, may not know about the program, this is a professional Master of Engineering program and is designed to provide uh, advanced technical skills in the cutting edge areas of surgery and intervention. Uh, provide aspects of professional development and soft skills. Uh, we also have a capstone design that students work on in the course of their work. And then we have an, our hallmark to the, the degree is uh, the amount of clinical immersion experiences. And so folks can really get a, a good understanding of where their technologies are deployed and how they're used. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you know, please be sure to look up, again, Vanderbilt's uh, Master of Engineering in Surgery and Intervention Program. You can find that at http uh, slash slash vu.edu slash esi. Uh, so with that background, uh, in our previous panel discussions over the last four that we've had now, uh, we discussed the roles of engineering and surgery in surgery intervention and with respect to things like open software development, uh, robotics, careers in industry, and the entre and entrepreneurial endeavors. So today I'm, I'm kind of excited really to talk a little bit different and, and take a little different topic on. Um, we spent a lot of time, you know, in the past research-wise on preclinical systems, things like small animals and mouse systems and things like that. But today's discoveries really are arising out of human data um, within the context of things like imaging, electronic health records and medical devices being deployed in human systems. And we're seeing something really new here uh, in, in, the, in the development of discovery and, and research. So the challenge is really how to create effective systems so we can get the information um, from these devices and things like that and get them to be able to kind of understand and create patient-specific approaches. So in today, um, today's panel, we're going to be talking a little bit about this idea of digital twins as a model of discovery, aspects of sensing devices and the new dimensions of data that they provide, and finally to look at um, next generational devices as well. So let me uh, introduce my, our panelists today for today. So first we have uh, Elizabeth Van Concelos, director of this uh, of the segment leader in software at uh, Clearpoint Neuro um, and we will be giving us some insight kind of on next generational uh, devices in the neurospace and kind of what's on that horizon and then we also have here Dr. Shaganti from um, who's a research and technology uh, manager for Siemens Health and Ears and she'll be giving us a sense of the digital twin work and some of these added dimensions uh, to data and whatnot so so welcome to both of you I, I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule I know you have things to do uh, during the day <laughs> so I, I appreciate you taking uh, 30 minutes out to come shoot the breeze with us. Okay, so let's, we'll, we'll jump right in, uh, if you don't mind. So I'll start with you, Elizabeth, and I was wondering, can you tell us a little bit about ClearPoint and about like, your role, kind of perhaps maybe some of the things that you're kind of, not necessarily working on, but some of the things that you're looking at in, in this space of, of kind of neuro devices and whatnot and what you're involved with? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for having me, by the way, on your panel. And um, it, it's really, really an honor. Uh, ClearPoint is a small medical device company that's based in Solana Beach, California. I'm remote. Um, I live in New York City. Um, and uh, ClearPoint is uh, essentially a, a stereotactic neuronavigation company. Um, they specialize in precision procedures. Um, delivering devices like DBS or laser therapy or drug delivery catheters. And um, the ClearPoint system, as it's known, is basically a miniaturized uh, stereotactic platform that's made from um, MRI safe materials so that you can deliver these devices in an MRI, which is sort of novel technology. Um, I'm relatively new to ClearPoint. Um, though I've worked, you know, in a sort of partner capacity with them for many years, uh, I am the director of um, and segment leader of systems and software, which is basically a marketing role um, that I would classify as a uh, upstream product management type of role. And so that means that I work across uh, the company with R and D, with clinical sales, regulatory. And, you know, what I'm responsible for is, is helping to set the, the roadmap and strategy for our software and systems um, so that they can serve all of the different uh, clinical procedures. And, you know, I think you want a little bit about like what, what we're doing now and what some of the innovations are. You know, a couple of things to mention is sort of the, the recent move to expand the portfolio outside of the MRI and into the OR to be able to enable our procedures um, and expand our footprint. Um, we've also launched a new laser therapy system 
um, which has some really interesting and unique um, characteristics. And um, there's also a big push on the software side. So um, building algorithms that essentially enable some of these really complex workflows. One in particular is, you know, in the drug delivery space, if you're familiar with convection enhanced delivery of therapeutics to the brain, you understand there's a number of complicated 3D problems like, you know, where will the drug um, be delivered to and where has it delivered to already while you're in the procedure and developing algorithms to sort of solve those uh, unique problems is something that we're really focused on right now. So that's another area I'll have to talk to you later about. I've been doing some modeling in that area. So that's kind of neat that you're, that you're working on those types of things. And it sounds like, you know, from the perspective of what you're doing, you know, there's a real blurring of lines between imaging device and procedure. Um, really kind of, it sounds like pr pretty dynamic, you know, environment versus like, you know, the very separation that we had quite a, quite a few years ago between the, the roles. It seems like it's a blurring <laughs> of all of that. That's really interesting. That's really great stuff. Um, Shika, how about, how about you and some of the work that you're doing at, at the Health and Ears and kind of, you know, what's, what's your role there as well as some of the kind of developments that are going on and what you've been involved with? Can you speak to a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, Siemens uh, Health and Ears um, is, is a very big organization. Um, they have multiple business divisions. Uh, so, you know, everyone's probably familiar with uh, the, the devices, the CT and MR machines. So there's the diagnostic imaging team, there's uh, cancer care, there's advanced therapies, there's laboratory diagnostics, and so on. Um, it's um, like a huge uh, healthcare services and solutions uh, organization. Uh, where I work, though, is a very small group um, that focuses on AI and innovation. Um, so what we do is um, not as much. I mean, we, we do work with, we have touch points with all of these uh, divisions, uh, but we are uh, basically the experts uh, in, in, in AI and wherever there could be an AI solution in the space, uh, we come in, we have uh, teams that are focused on uh, different parts of the body, different diseases, um, intervention versus imaging versus NLP and so on. But um, we, we provide uh, the AI expertise uh, for the business. Um, we do work on a lot of uh, business projects, but we also focus, uh, since we are an innovation team, we also focus on a lot of um, research as well. We work with uh, medical centers. Um, and we, like, uh, when I started off uh, at, at, at Siemens Health Engineers um, as, as an AI scientist, uh, my job was like a lot like um, how it was in grad school, re reading papers, doing research, writing grants, you know, executing what you've done in papers and so on. And then uh, now I've also led a few projects and that, in excuse me, um, that involves talking more uh, with uh, key opinion leaders in, in, the, in the medical industry, providers, and then also talking uh, to business leaders to see where uh, we can make um, the greatest clinical impact. Uh, and that is like a role that we have to balance very well in our center is not only do we need to focus on cutting edge technologies in, in AI solutions, but also we need to be aware of where they can have uh, the maximum clinical impact. Um, so those are some of, uh, it's, it's a very wide uh, array of problems that we solve, but that's a general overview. So it's funny, we were talking about, you know, you know, we have aspects of customer discovery that you still do even now, these many years later. And and you you were here at Vanderbilt side, so full full disclosure there, you're one of our alum, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but the um, but it sounds like you really, I mean, you know, when you were here, I remember when you were here, you did a lot of work on really heterogeneous data. You were looking mm -hmm. at ophthalmological, you know, applications back then. And and um, it sounds like you are, you know, seeing even more, you know, heterogeneity of data. And it's something that's, you know, really something that uh, from a technology standpoint, AI standpoint, you really have to bring together to kind of create new products, which that's, that's pretty exciting stuff in terms of what you're seeing. Yeah. 
That's excellent. So staying with you, actually, um, Shekha, if you don't mind, uh, you know, this idea, we talked a little about kind of this idea of a digital human, this kind of digital twin uh, technology. I guess, you know, what I'd like to get a, you know, a little more broader look at it, given that you're looking in the AI world and a lot of data, the data world, you know, I guess, what does that mean to you? What does the digital twin technology mean to you? And, and maybe why are you kind of excited about that? And, and maybe what its impact might be that you could see? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's it's a very uh, big topic, um, and I think it's it's also become a buzzword now. Uh, but essentially, a digital twin, and they've been in use in other industries for a very long time, is basically a digital model of a physical object, and they've been used in manufacturing and automobile industries, among other industries, for a very long time. Um, so it's it's very nice to have a digital model. Uh, of a physical object, so you can test on that, you can do um, experiments on that, simulations on that to see how it's working, and then you implement that in the real world. Uh, of course, now the idea of digital twins in healthcare, um, I mean, people have, even in healthcare, they've talked about different types of digital twins, like a digital twin of a doctor, digital twin of a nurse, digital twin of like surgical devices, a digital twins of humans, and so on, right? Uh, but when you're talking about digital twins of humans, it it becomes a much more complex problem uh, since you know human bodies are much more complex than a car uh, or you know a part in a manufacturing plant. Um, and also, when when people are talking about digital twins of of the human body, I've also seen that they're talking about a very uh, diverse set of ideas. The most ambitious of which is having a digital version of yourself that continues to grow uh, with you um, in, in the digital world. It keeps staking in the data, like everything that happens to you, you feed, you you know, maybe you're able to feed that to the digital model and it grows with you. And whatever um, uh, happens to you, maybe you can predict it happening in the digital model. Um, you can try interventions on the digital model before you try it on yourself and so on. So that is the most ambitious idea. And of course, we are, uh, you know, quite a few ways from that. Uh, and then people also talk in more specific settings, like let's say you want to do an intervention, give a medication or a surgical treatment. Um, can you try that specific um, you know, can you de develop digital twins of like an organ, like a digital twin of the heart or something? So you can try an intervention on that to see how it responds. Uh, people also talk about it in, in wellness space um, uh, to, to see how to use this technology, technology to live better, eat better, um, and, and so on. Um, so we are talking really about like a wide array of problems um, here. And also leading to many challenges from sensing because when you want to learn about the complexity of a human body you need to collect a lot of data um, and we, we've talked about this a little bit offline just now you know right now data is co collected pretty sporadically like maybe you you go to your physical once a year or you just go when you have a symptom or an adverse event um, so there's very uh, sporadic data uh, that's collected on us of course, now we have wearables. A lot of us are using Apple Watches and things like that. And maybe there is like more data collection, but it's still limited. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a lot of like problems open in sensing to sense the state of a human body more accurately, continuously, longitudinally. And then there's a lot of challenges in modeling. Um, like how do you absorb all of this data? Even starting with something as simple as where do you store all this data, right? Because traditionally, we are we have EHR systems, we have PAC systems. Uh, we talked a little about pathology, like a lot of hospitals still store slides in a drawer, you know? Um, and there's genetic data. A lot of people are doing direct-to-consumer genetic testing uh, at home. Uh, there's wearables at home. Where does all this data merge? And where does it all connect? It's a very challenging problem. And what are the data models to absorb it? That's starting from just the absorption of the data to modeling of the data. There's just many challenges that yeah. are in the space. 
That's that's really fascinating. I mean, it really, I mean, we start to think about that more broadly as you speak. I'm kind of thinking, you know, you know, we think of something really simple. You know, if I, if I do a survey with my doctor, I'm eating too much fatty food. They tell me, you know, I got to go on a statin or something like that. But you're really talking about almost like a living, breathing thing with respect to the data itself, and that that absorbs it, mm-hmm. you know, eventually or or incorporates every part of our life. If if it's I mean, nowadays we everything's documented to some degree, but then. That's great. What do you store? And then also, you know, how do you incorporate that into what kind of model? What does it look like? I mean, you have to come up with, it's real, that's really interesting. And then the idea of it being used in a predictive capacity, that's just super fascinating. I mean, it's, it's it blows your mind a little bit in terms of um, where it could go. Yeah. But I, I don't totally can appreciate uh, the complexity of that problem. That sounds, I, I can't run my little systems in the lab with small pots, parts, piece, pieces of data, Never mind that kind of thing. So that's really fascinating. And I think it really does require like a large scale, you know, company like a Siemens in order to kind of go after something like that. That's mm-hmm. huge. Um, that's good. That's great. Um, go, going back to you, Elizabeth, you know, I've, I've watched mm-hmm. your career over the years, you know, first at Brain Lab, then uh, BlackRock, uh, Neurotech and now at ClearPoint, you know, so you, you really have, and you kind of alluded to it before, you know, you've had a pretty good survey of the neurospace device space uh, in general, going really from, you know, basic tumor resection all the way out to kind of, you know, functional neurosurgery now at, at ClearPoint. So I guess, you know, what, you know, what are the things that you're seeing in the device development area? What, do, what are you excited about? And, and, and what do you think the impact of that is? And if you could speak to data, that'd be great too. <laughs> Yeah, and really fascinating, Chico. Like, I, you know, I will say that these are problems that I've mulled over with colleagues as well, and um, really interesting problem to solve. Um, I think also just another point on that before I jump into your question is just who would pay for it? And, who, you know, you were talking about where is it stored, but right, like, where's the incentives on the industry side? Um, it's 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 definitely a, an, an interesting challenge. So, um, but but back to your your question, Mike. Um, yeah, I, my my experience is really centered in neurosurgery. So I'll speak from from neurosurgery. Um, you know, I think the last ten years, really, the focus has been on minimally invasive surgery and robotics and enabling technologies. And you know, I think these. These fields will continue to grow, um, but I think the focus needs to be and and, and is on providing devices that are less expensive and more purpose built, which means, you know, moving away from probably larger industrial robots, leveraging new materials, manufacturing techniques. You know, the only way to really expand the footprint and give access to more people and and expand these therapies is to make them less expensive and more accessible. And so that's definitely something that I'm seeing in enabling technologies. Um, On the therapy side in neuro, I'm seeing a lot of neuromodulation devices and startups in bioelectronic medicine. You know, you see there just tons. Um, And I think, you know, this is the consequence of a lot of really great foundational research and discovery and connectomics and understanding and uh, maybe illuminating the, the circuitry and the neural pathways of the body, right? Knowing where to target and what to stimulate, what to what to disrupt. Um, and I think this is gonna have a really, really great impact in addressing unmet needs for neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and I think that's you know something that I, I just am seeing more and more. And, and then on the software and AI side, I mean, there's just also a big, big push, AR, VR, AI, um, computer vision, I think that, from a surgery perspective, if I'm going to limit the scope to some degree, um, I think there's there's a very near promise to deliver guidance and data to surgeons, you know, during the procedure that, and this of course could help level up the novice surgeons or less specialized surgeons. Again, increasing the access outside of some of these, you know, premier centers and and being able to, you know 
get these procedures to other people who don't have access currently. Yeah, I mean, the neural space is a great space to watch in general for a lot of these things, only because, you know, a lot of the guidance stuff really started first there uh, to some degree. Minimally invasive, you could argue, you know, started in the abdomen with some laparoscopic stuff a little earlier. But when it comes to, you know, really trying to push the edge, you know, cut, you know, really kind of do novel and new therapies, you know, neuro has really been out front and they've had a, several different initiatives dealing over the years, federally sponsored, you know, that have also been really contributing to that area. And I think, um, the neuromod area has been a fascinating area to me um, in general. It's one of the ones where I, when I think about, when we talk, we talk about randomized trials and things like that, I always think of neuromod as the, the, the counter to that. So I'm not saying there's not randomized trials and things, but it started almost at an experimental level, you know, with human data in a lot of ways. And it was really kind of, you know, trying to correct conditions that were just non-tractable um, and, and looking for alternative solutions. And, you know, the, 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 the OR can be a little bit of a place where you can learn enough to actually, you know, create therapies um, versus like preclinical environments and things like that as well. And I think Neuromod is kind of one of those areas that really has kind of grown in that direction. It really shows us the way in a lot of places. I think your comment on the platform designs is interesting because there are, you know, robotic platform designs that are being, you know, pushed off to multiple different surgery types, but then again, those are a little bit maybe mismatched as well. So it's interesting to see kind of how that space will develop going forward. Um, it's, it's unclear to me. I ask that question all the time in, in my uh, provocative questions course as to, you know, is it is it going to be more modular? How specific will it be? You know, how ubiquitous do you need your your, your platforms to be? And then low cost, is, that seems to be everywhere. Um, that inability to to put it out into um, areas that, have, that are le less served by the high-tech hospitals, that kind of thing too. It seems to be, uh, if you really wanna translate, you know, health care out uh, uh, from the cities, and we need to do that as a, as a society, I think in general, so that's great. Um, yeah, so that's, that's so, so we kind of did some of the research side of things. We're gonna a little bit, little change a little bit more towards the focus um, you know, regarding our program, and I'll ask you a couple of questions in there, and we'll see, see what you think. So starting with you, Shikai, I know when you were here, um, we, you know, you were in the T32, which is an NIH training program, and we did a lot of work in clinical immersion and whatnot. And so one of the features of our master's program you know, of engineering and surgery and intervention is this idea of immersive experiences. And I guess, you know, as you, you've moved on in your career now, and you're quite a bit further in now, um, I guess when you think about what, what has, has that kind of experience, was, or are those type of experiences important for, um, for, your, for your career? And then as for the folks that you're hire, you know, that, that exposure to clinical, I'll say clinical and patient environments, which is a little bit different than necessarily pure surgery. You know, I, I guess, did you, have you seen that as a benefit? And, and for the folks that you're hiring, do you think that's important? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, I would say that those experiences have had a huge impact on my own personal understanding um, of the field. And uh, I know that a lot of people don't have opportunities uh, to have these experiences. So I, you know, when we are hiring, we, we do understand that, but it is something that we want to um, look at, right? So it, you could, we are um, an AI center. We, we are looking at people with computer science degrees and having uh, technical skills is, is very important. But with any AI program, um, I would say, but especially with, with healthcare uh, applications, you really need to understand what it is that you're solving and what it is that you're doing. Um, sometimes I've, I've noticed that, you know, engineers, as, as we do, we get very excited about a technical problem and we want to model something complex. And often maybe there is little to no clinical impact in, in doing that, or maybe it's actually more disruptive to the clinical space than uh, helpful. And these are the types of things that are very difficult to understand. And uh, the program uh, that I had at, at Vanderbilt really gave me the opportunity uh, to talk to so many uh, providers, surgeons, clinicians, to understand what their daily challenges are and uh, the provo provocative questions course that you just mentioned that was really helpful i mean at first it was really daunting because you don't know how to think about clinical problems you're like an engineer and i took like biology years ago but 
you know, you kind of like get into it, kind of reminds me of, you know, when you learn swimming first, you need to get comfortable in the water, That's right? right? So mm -hmm. it's kind of like you need to learn to understand their language. Uh, even the terms that we use are very different. Mm -hmm. um, starting from, even though we're we're all communicating in English, because of our training, we have very different ways of thinking. Um, so just the ability to talk to clinicians and understand what needs to be solved um, and where can we have the biggest impact is a very, very important skill. And I would urge like all engineers to think about that. I mean, especially in healthcare space, but in any AI problem. I mean, we've, we've been seeing quite, quite a bit about the impact of AI um, on society and the world. And part of it is maybe like not thinking through what could happen when, when you are um, using your algorithms, right? So that is like a very important skill. I mean, I always look for uh, that um, in, in, in uh, people who are joining the company. And it's, it's just, I, can't, I cannot stress enough how important it is to have like some clinical understanding of what uh, problems you're trying to solve. Yeah, I can't, I can't tell you how many times I've you know sat with physicians and they'll come up with one point that they may not think is important. It's, it's such a small point of their process. And when they tell me, I'm like, oh, geez, I got to redesign something mm -hmm. just based on that one little, little little quirk in terms of the order in which they do a procedure or something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's a little different in the AI space, but, you know, knowing what that data is, what its impact is and how it's read. And all, I mean, those are all, all very, very similar you know aspects to it. Mm -hmm. And then even the... Um, the order and kind of understanding of how they use symptomology, you know, to make their diagnosis and those kinds of things are just also important. Um, Elizabeth, kind of the same thing to you. I mean, I, you know, the neurospace in general has a, a lot of nuance in terms of procedure. I don't, I don't know if you've had any, you know, exposure to that to some degree about, you know, is, is our clinical experience is kind of important for the for the folks that you hire, um, kind of understand that space a little bit in terms of the impact to, to, to what they're trying to design, I guess, and what they're trying to build. Yeah, I mean, I, I echo everything, you know, that, that you both have, have said about this. And I'll, I'll add that, you know, I, I had this, my own personal experience coming from grad school, um, wanting to work in medical devices, but I actually didn't have, you know, any industry experience. And what ended up making me a strong candidate was the clinical work I had done between my BS and my MS, which, you know, um, I had even, you know, done a co-op as a surgical tech, you know, in undergrad. It was, you know, a great experience, but I, I didn't intentionally do that. In some ways, I got lucky that I happened to, 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 uh, to do that. And so, um, you know, I can't really underestimate the, the value here the same. I, I think, again just like swimming in the in the water you know just being in the water first understanding the nomenclature seeing the users and how they work together as a team is really critical mm -hmm. um, i think that when you get to work um, in an atmosphere in school like like the program at vanderbilt you it's it's better than observation observation you you can get some information but until you're working with and next to the users you won't understand the why because yeah. you have to ask um, and have and have access to them and and if, have practice trying to solve problems for them and the other thing is you you if you're you know smart about it you take that opportunity and you get to see competing technologies or solutions that are trying to solve the same problem and you see where they succeed or where they fail and you see you know does this particular device is so cool but you know maybe it's over engineered because you need a, someone with really highly specialized skills that doesn't exist in that paradigm mm -hmm. or you know you might it might have a lot of parts that get lost in mm -hmm. sterile processing or um you know, uh, yeah, th there's a number of things, right? It could just be unreliable because it's complex. And when you get to spend time in environments like this is when really the ideas are born. You understand the problems you're trying to solve. You learn a lot about how not to do it. You see where there's opportunities. 
and 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 along the way you sort of gain these practical skills so you mentioned customer discovery you start to develop a way of interviewing users you yeah. develop a methodology um, even if you don't realize you're doing it you get to watch other people do it and take the good and the bad and so that when you know you're interviewing for a company and you can sort of express these things firsthand it's it's very um, authentic and you know it when you've got somebody in the interviewee seat that mm -hmm. can talk about these things and have lived it. They can't, you can't listen to this webcast and hear me say that and just say what I said verbatim. You, you know, you have to actually live it to, to, to contribute to a conversation like that. Um, and so it is, it's really important. I feel like you've been listening to my lab meetings because we have this all the time about sterility and part, too many parts and we're losing things. And oh, it's, it's so true. The devil's <laughs> in the true. details. <laughs> That's true. We're coming to the close here, but I want to ask one one last question to both of you, which is, you know, you had long you have careers now, right? The prime of your careers and seen a lot over the, over the course of those. I guess, do you have any parting tips to, you know, folks that might be considering getting into this area of, you know, um, high tech with respect to surgery and intervention and kind of you know, how exciting is the space? You got any tips for our, our users? I'll start with you, Shika, and then I'll go to you, Elizabeth, at the end. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think it's a it's a very exciting space to be in um, right now. Um, a lot of, um, uh, if, if you look at the direction of um, um, health problems in the future, we were, we're looking at an increase in chronic diseases. People are living longer. So, the longer you live, the, the more um, chronic diseases there are. And these actually have a very different paradigm than uh, some of the acute problems that we've learned to solve uh, in medicine. We have not learned to solve uh, or deal with chronic diseases as, because they, they tend to be such intractable problems. There's too many things at play. It's not just about taking a medication. It's not about just doing an intervention. All of the the middle of like, if you have a high stress job, if you are exercising regularly, if you're eating right, um, you know, if you're meditating or not, like, you know, or if you have some other genetic conditions, there's so many things that go into it. Um, those are the types of problems that we have not yet learned to solve very well, but maybe with new technologies like AI and, and foundation models and so on, maybe we have, uh, a glimmer of hope in, in maybe being able to solve them. Um, you know, so that is like an area that I'm really looking forward to making it. It's, it's a small thing to think about, uh, but it has like a very big impact uh, in my opinion. So that is something that I'm really looking forward to. Absolutely. Elizabeth, how about you? Any tips or last minute things, last minute thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I to sort of build on that on the device space and in surgery, I, I think that a lot of the technologies have been reactive. Um, you know, surgery in general is destructive, um, and and you know the innovations are really about minimizing risk and increasing you know um, you know your recovery response and, and all of that. But I think where you see a shift is and and i think the areas to to jump on if, if i were to be joining you know the the med device uh space would be you know to look at the therapies that address the underlying disease and cause like you know targeted delivery of gene and cell therapies or mm -hmm. bioelectronic devices and you know those are really going to you know have the potential for a cure um, have the potential to really stop disease um, and, and things like that. Um, so, you know, I think those are the great opportunities um, that, are, that are out there today. Well, that's great. I really, uh, this has been great. We have to wrap, we have to wrap I, I could talk all afternoon with this, but it's really interesting work that you're both doing. And as well as I think um, these are all super interesting topics. I think actually we'll probably have another one of these at some point, because I think it's, this is such a growing area and, and it's so, it's so uh, compl complicated, but interesting. Uh, and it, and it, it blends a lot of things, not just procedure, but lifestyle changes and, and, and structure of healthcare and 
all these things, all, even even the type of device and the extent of how these devices interact with humans. I think it's it's awesome too. Um, but that we have to we have to wrap things up. So I'd like to thank both uh, Elizabeth and Shika for joining us. Um, I, I really appreciate. I know you're busy, and this is kind of one of those things. What's he? What's he want? <laughs> but um, it's it's. I really appreciate it, and I do think it helps uh, students understand where how the space is growing and what the opportunities are. I think you, really, both of you, have really represented that really well. I think the students really appreciate it too. Um, so with that, uh, thanks, and um, I, I'll give my last disclaimer. I, I'm no expert MC at any of this. I'm just an engineering researcher, just like everybody else. So if I fumbled and I bumbled, as I always tell my kids, I will do better next time. So, so take care, and I will see you next. I mean, time. can I add on to that disclaimer? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> like I, I was saying, right? I, can I add on to that disclaimer? I'm also, you know, if uh, the, there's a, a lot of these things are are just um, some of the opinions that I have uh, about healthcare space, and uh, you know, if if anyone uh, thinks otherwise, like I, I would welcome comments and questions. But yeah. Yep. You know, we're all learning and it's it's a very uh, new and interesting space. Yeah, that's kind of the point of these really is just to introduce folks that are working in this space mm -hmm. and kind of just seeing things, seeing things and seeing how things are evolving. And I mean, it's it's a breakneck speed. There's no question about how fast this this all moves. And, um, you know, you all are, are staying right on top of the wave, <laughs> moving, moving with it. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So um, thanks again. Appreciate your time.